recording. There we go. Recording in progress. Well, welcome. Welcome to Schoenberg's return in commemoration of the great composer's re-entry into the community of Israel, as he called his July 24th, 1933, reaffirmation of the Jewish faith he'd been born into. Like many Jews of his time, he had converted to Protestantism earlier. Uh, it's the first text in the following presentation. But in the face of rapidly growing anti-Semitism uh, in Germany and in Europe generally, he felt compelled to stand with his people. In my own humble, secular, aesthetic way, I hope I'm both celebrating and appropriating his gesture with this little event. <clears throat> Now, I'm the furthest thing from an expert on Schoenberg, and admittedly, I find his music often as challenging as other people have complained about it. But um, I mean, I, I, I enjoy every kind of music. But what drew me to his music particularly was Sprechstimme, the speaking singing that he, hi, David, <laughs> uh, that he, um, uh, pioneered and and I don't think anyone else has done anything quite like it uh, being a theater man and a, a singer I love the sheer beauty of the human voice and I think his choral speaking singing that when that when I first heard that sound I was transported and I even his some of his other music I maybe okay I, I don't know if I can listen to this a lot but that sound I find I can really enjoy so um, I'm also far more knowledgeable about anti-Semitism than I am about Judaism as a patrilineal Jew who has never been religious according to official standards. But neither am I anti-religious. All that's associated with monotheism and the religions emerging from the Abrahamic source fascinates me and I believe underlies the most important conflicts and creative possibilities of our increasingly global culture. Schoenberg's meditations on these questions, which he as a youth referred to as dialectical, coming from a devout mother and a free thinking, I believe atheist father, form a passionate, eloquent, astonishing meditation on language, images and truth. I've mixed texts from different time periods to form a sort of dialogue on a series of themes. Um, and I'll, I'll share my screen so you'll see what I'm reading. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit. Actually, let me share my screen right now. I'll tell you a little bit about my sources. Uh, there we go. So here we have my sources on the right. The major source texts by Schoenberg for, the, for Schoenberg's return include the play script that he wrote for the Der Biblische Weg, The Biblical Way, uh, where you see the character of Max Ahrens, that's from that. His libretto of Moses and Aaron, uh, the characters of Moses, the chorus, 70 elders, youth. His very famous piece of Survivor from Warsaw, uh, the words of the survivor were, Schoenberg said, based partly upon reports which I have received directly or indirectly. His four-point program for Jewry in 1938, letters and occasional writings. You guys are sharing my screen, you can see it okay? Yeah, okay. Let me give you very quickly the relevant chronology so you have a bit of background. So he's born in 1874, um, 13th of September, my mother was born on the 12th, uh, not 1874. Uh, circumcised according to Jewish rite, eight days later. 1879, this is social and personal chronology. So 1879, Wilhelm Marr, originator of the term anti-Semitism, founds the Austrian Anti-Semitic League. Adolf Hitler born, uh, Herzl's Judenstadt launches Zionism as a modern political movement. Schoenberg, and this is the key point, accepts baptism in the Protestant Dorothea community in 1898. Uh, 18, in 1915, enters military service. 1929, uh, 21, this will come up in the text, the Schoenbergs are forced to leave Matze, where Jews are considered undesirable. Uh, 1931, first act of Moses and Aaron finished stormtroopers attacking Jews who are attending uh, services. 33, Hitler seizes power. Uh, Schoenberg and Jewish colleagues dismissed without compensation. Um, 33 is when he 
makes this uh, re-entry into the community of Israel specifically. 34, he moves to the States. Uh, 38, Austria joins the Third Reich, Kristallnacht. Uh, 43, Germany, Judenwein, Jew free, Polish ghettos liquidated. Uh, 1944, the composer in ill health in his 70th year retires from university teaching. War ends, Nuremberg trials, the 22nd Zionist Congress after the war demands the immediate creation of a Jewish state. 1947, survivor from Warsaw. Right? 1948, newly proclaimed state of Israel attacked by the Arab countries. 1950, Opus 55, uh, his last work dedicated to the state of Israel. Vienna makes him an honorary citizen. 1951, honorary chairmanship of the Jerusalem Music Academy. He had wanted to go to Israel, like Moses, didn't make it. Passes away on the 13th of July. Okay, finally, there are some small sound effects, sound bits in what follows. Uh, they're just sketches, they're kind of uh, mix, what do you call that? Mix downs. Here we go. Schoenberg's return to commemoration of the 88th anniversary of Arnold Schoenberg's 1933 re-entry into the community of Israel. Uh, a Salon of Sheikh event. You are in the Salon of the House of Sheikh. Welcome. Prelude. Arnold Franz Walter Schoenberg, Vienna 11, Leopoldsgasse 9, Baptism, 25th of March, 1898. Priest Alfred Formi, Godfather Walter Pio, opera singer, Vienna 1, Bauernmarket 3. Most of all, I would like to write for a magic theater. Toward the end, it got very ugly in Matze. The people there seemed to despise me so much, it was as though they knew my music. The survivor, I can't remember everything. I must have been unconscious most of the time. I remember only the grandiose moment when they all started to sing as if prearranged the old prayer they had neglected for some. <laughs> For so many years, the forgotten creed. Now Max Ahrens, what is this festival? Is it a sports event, a parade, a party convention, a people's assembly? Is not this day like all others? No, it's not. It's the one that will be commemorated for all time among Jews, just like that day on which the youngest male asks, why do we sit reclining? But here you will have to ask instead, why do we all stand up? Why did we rise? Why don't we remain seated on the floor low like in those days past? We got up, we rose, and rose to a size that nobody could have foreseen. But the Jewish body is divided in a very complex way. Primarily, the whole body is divided into three principal sections, hostile to each other according to religion, orthodox, reformist, atheist. Then each of these groups is broken according to socio-political principles into conservatives, liberal socialists. Further, the origin of the Jews as East, Western, Eastern, Oriental, again, subdivides every group. And finally, each one of these geographic groups include nationalities, 
eager to preserve their respective peculiarities, proud of them, hostile toward all the others, and increasing the tendency to splinter in an almost, into an almost unlimited number of isms. This is bad enough, but in fact, it's still worse. Jews are individualists, educated during thousands of years by their, by their teachers in exegesis of the secrets of the Bible. They're accustomed to finding individual resolutions of their problems. They are now applying the same individualism in the field of politics. Probably every Jew will apply his own way of thinking, a homemade theory, a personal attitude to every problem he faces. Nothing could be more disastrous to a people than that. Never enter into discussion because every Jew is superior to every Jew and will apply logic better than every other Jew. And he will win or at least the other will lose. At least time will be lost. Never enter into discussion. In spite of its antagonism to unanimity, no, no one, will, uh, one will understand that it is not by any means an accident that we are thus constituted. It is my belief that this astonishing mentality is a divine gift destined to protect us, to enable us to outlast the diaspora with its persecutions and its dangers to personal life and to the existence of our people. Moses, law of thought, irresistible, forces fulfillment. Two, chorus. We are his chosen folk before others. We are the chosen ones, him alone to worship, him alone to serve. We shall be free then from toil and misery. This is his promise. He'll lead us then to a land where milk and honey flow, and we shall enjoy then what he, what he once did promise our fathers. Almighty, thou art stronger than Egyptian gods are. Moses, you then desired actually, physically, to tread with your feet upon an unreal land where milk and honey flowed. You then struck the rock instead of speaking to it, as you were commanded to do in order to make water flow forth from it. The word alone was to have struck forth refreshment from the naked rock. Everywhere now wine is given out in streams. A wild drunkenness overtakes everyone. Heavy stone jars are thrown about. The people shower wine and implements upon each other during extravagant dancing, whereupon quar quarreling and fighting break out here and there. Moses, inconceivable God, inexpressible many-sided idea. Will you let it be so explained? Shall Aaron my mouth fashion this image? Then I have fashioned an image too, false as an image must be. Thus I am defeated. Thus all was but madness that I believed before and can and must not be given voice. O oh, word, thou word that I lack. I propose to move the Jewish community to its very depths by a graphic demonstration of what lies in store for the German Jews unless they receive help within the next two or three months. Every keen and realistic observer should have known this beforehand as I knew it almost 20 years ago. Even one who does not overrate Jewish intelligence in political affairs will admit that every Jew should have known at least that the fate of the Austrian and Hungarian Jews was sealed years ago. And can a man with foresight deny that the Jews of Romania and Poland are in danger of a similar fate? Once the fiend has stormed and entered the fortress and started to plunder, there's no chance of negotiation and often to offer to surrender. There remains either to abandon resistance in despair or to fight the fiend to the bitter end. The decision will not be sought anymore in discussing right or wrong. His right is force. The other's wrong is weakness. How long is this to continue? 40 days now we have awaited Moses and still no one knows either law or command, unperceivable command from one who's yet unperceived. They came out, some very slowly, the old ones, the sick ones, some with nervous agility. They fear the sergeant. They hurry as much as they can, in vain. Much too much noise, much too much commotion, and not fast enough. The Feldwebel shouts, Achtung! The sergeant and his subordinates hit everyone, young or old, strong or sick, quiet, guilty or innocent. Blood offering, as high as thought were we once upraised, present, afar, future, at hand. 
deep as life are we degraded? Are they condemned to doom? Will they become extinct, famished, butchered? There's no conceivable reason why people should hate us. We know we're not as our enemies describe us. On the contrary, if it were for our qualities, we should be liked and admired. We're generous, good-natured, faithful, honest at least in the same degree as other people. In our minds has anchored the obligation to help the poor, which has been an especial part of our religious law for 5,000 years. Considered a minor kind of human being, suppressed, outlawed, suspected, shown, shown hostility, we're scarcely dared to be, we scarcely dared asked to be treated lawfully and avoided as much as possible the irritation of our enemies so as not to become exposed to their anger. How could it happen that men, that men who even did not ask for equality could be called arrogant? Nevertheless, the arrogance of the Jews is the very cause of anti-Semitism. Only this term does not refer to the behavior or attitude of the single person, but to the whole of us, to the entire Jewry. Every non-Jew believes, consciously or subconsciously, that in every Jew is alive the feeling that he's different from other peoples because by his belonging to God's elect, elected people. This is what they antagonizingly call great presumption, and to that they react with contempt and hatred. But we possess one quality which seems remarkable, if not unique. Whilst other peoples have been converted, it has been impossible to convert Israel. It is our devotion to an idea, to an ideal, and it springs from our deep devotion to an inherited faith. We are an old people. What would a God mean to us whom we could understand, of whom we could form an image, on whom we might prevail? We don't need miracles. Persecution and contempt have made us strong, have multiplied our tenacity and resilience, generated and improved organs that, are ha that enhance our ability to resist. We are an old people. What I've been compelled to learn this last year, I've now finally understood and shall never forget. I'm neither a German nor a European, nor even a man. The vilest of Europeans throws his race in my face. I am a Jew. I'm quite content. Today, I hope for no exception with regard to myself. I do not object to being tarred with the same brush as the others, for I have seen that the other side, which is no longer in any way exemplary for me, are also all to be tarred with the same brush. Someone whom I had thought to be on the same level as myself, I've seen associating himself with this band. I've even, I have heard that even Kandinsky only saw those actions of the Jews which were despicable and only those despicable actions which were committed by the Jews. And consequently, I've lost any hope of reaching an understanding. It was a dream. There are two humanities, definitely. I now call myself a Jew with pride, but I know how difficult it is really to be one. The Messiah of inner equilibrium. Today, you bring your people to this. You bring your people the sacrifice of all your former striving after those intellectual goods that serve the diaspora. And today you affirm with all your strength that you are ready to serve a knowledge higher than all human wisdom, that you want to make it possible for your people to live out its God idea, to dream it to the very end. The learned Philistines abhor mysteries because they reveal that which can never be proven.
But I see him not. Where is he? Has he a gentle or angry mien? Am I to love him or to fear him? Where is he? Point him out. We want to kneel down. We want to bring beasts forth to him and gold and wheat and barley and wine. All will go to your God Almighty if we're his people, if he is our God now, and if he guards us well. But then where is he? Point him out. I must conclude that I've made a very great moral and tactical mistake. I've accepted the discussion. I've entered into a polemic. I have defended myself. In doing so, I've forgotten that it's a matter neither of law, nor of absence of law, nor of truth, nor of falsehood, nor of knowledge, nor of ignorance, but of power relations. I forgot that, this, that the discussion had no sense, since in any case I shall not be heard, and that there is no wish to understand if it is not that of, if it is not, that of not hearing what the other says. Could Kandinsky not foresee all that? Could he not sense what was going to happen? But in the way stand, you shall be invincible and it shall achieve the goal, unity with God. The survivor. I must have been unconscious. The next thing I heard was a soldier saying, they're all dead. Whereupon the, sword, the sergeant ordered to do away with us. There I lay aside half conscious. I had become very still, fear and pain. Then I heard the so sergeant shouting, Abzählen! They started slowly and irregularly. One, two, three, four. Achtung! They began again, first slowly. One, two, three, four. It became faster and faster, so fast that it finding, finally sounded like a stampede of wild horses. And all of a sudden, in the middle of it, they began singing the Shema Israel here. Oh, Israel. Harmony. Epilogue. On the 24th of July, 1933, Monsieur Arnold Schoenberg, born in Vienna, September 13th, 1874, presented himself before us. Louis Germain Lévy, rabbi of the Union Libérale Israelite, 24 Rue Copernic in Paris, in order to express his formal desire to return to the community of Israel. After having been given this present declaration to read, Mr. Arnold, Monsieur Arnold Schoenberg stated that it truly expressed his thought and intention. Written in Paris in my, in my study, 24 Rue Copernic, 24th of July, 1933, read and approved Arnold Schoenberg, Louis Germain Levy, Rabbi, witnesses Dr. Marianoff, Mark Chagall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you could follow along and sort of an arc to that. And David and Michael. And I'm so glad you could join me. Uh, it was incredible. It was clearly somewhat cathartic for me, which was the intention. I'm sure his action was cathartic for him. Valuable work. Yes, I, th I think it is quite relevant today. Um, it, ma it makes me want to uh, read, uh, uh, read more about him because it seems like his experience is, it parallels a lot of what we're going through yeah. uh, today. 
Let me, I'm going to actually share a file. This is the whole text with the bibliography and everything. Oh, great. Um, I thought people might find that useful. Uh, let's see here. I'm not sharing my screen, so you don't know that I'm poking around trying to figure out where I have this. Um, oh, sure. This is just a great number of people to have in my salon for the first <laughs> salon. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, here we go. Project. Um, we go, Schoenberg's return. So I'm just sharing that hopefully to the chat. If it works, everything's frozen up, that's okay. So if anybody has to leave, feel free. I um, greatly appreciate it, it's really enjoyable. Um, yeah. In the meantime, you can hang out a bit longer too. My computer's stuck anyway, it doesn't seem to be wanting to just <laughs> want to send a file. Come on, you can do it, PDF. What if I just go like this? Oh, no. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I have all your email addresses. I can always I'll, I'll find yeah, I was so I send you the. Uh, I don't know what my computer's doing here, but it doesn't matter. Um, no, it's really, um, uh, you know, the fact my, my upbringing, was, I, mean, I didn't have religious parents. He had, on, at least on one side, his mother was religious, devoutly religious, apparently. His father was, they say, a free thinker or at least bordering on atheist. Um, and so I often describe my own religious position as being on the other side of a Mobius strip from a believer. So, you know, I mean, Mobius strip has one side. The only place it has two sides is right where it's standing. So, um, uh, I, I, I don't know. For some reason, it's, it's very important to me. And, and um, clearly, it's very important culturally. So that's good. Oh, something's happening. What's happening here? Let's go back. So I'll just, I'll just put back in here. I'll say th th thank you, uh, Michael. Um, you can call me Robin too. This is my. Well, I can call you Robin. For, for those of you who don't know, um, <laughs> Michael, Robin, uh, and I. Um, well, we're, we're cousins, um, and uh, so we go back. We go way back. We go way back. I was, I was known by, in the family who was always known as Robin. I, that was his mother's preference uh, when he was born. I, and I actually uh, remember that. So. Um, <laughs> And um, for this, I, I wasn't um, familiar with this with this story at all, but I'm, I'm glad that you brought it to, to my attention. Um, and um, of course, it makes me think of um, my own father who went through the um, Holocaust and who you knew well. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I think that, you know, I think that Schoenberg gets at a lot of the reasons behind it in a very forthright kind of no BS sort of way. Um, and, and I appreciate that about his perspective a lot. Um, okay, hey, my computer seems to be working again. Okay, I'm gonna share this to the chat now. Um, I have to, if I can say that uh, the part that you read where uh, he's saying, didn't everyone uh, or everybody did know they could see 20 years in advance what was going to happen. And, you know, that really kind of cut, cuts deep because, I mean, to me, I could see 20 years ago, I could see where that we were headed to the place we are at now, uh, you know, because because anti-Semitism has taken its its on its new form, 
and it's it's just a deep a different um, mask for demonization of the Jewish people. And uh, so when you read that part, that that really struck at me um, because uh, it, you know it just touched the fears that I have. Not that the same, not that things will happen in the same way that it did in the past, but um, the world is being stirred and agitated um, against the Jews again, and it will take its own terrible form. I often have the feeling people are saying, just, we, I just want to demonize somebody. Come on, please just let me demonize somebody. And then it's like <laughs> the Jews who were the ones who came into the picture saying, you know, you shouldn't demonize anybody, <laughs> right? And there's a, like, come on, I just want, okay, then we'll demonize those people. They're the ones, you know, they must be the worst out of everybody. For sure. so, uh, Phyllis Chesler, the, the pioneering second wave feminist, um, yes. brilliant writer, uh, I, I mean, has written on so many subjects. It's absolutely yes. mind boggling that, territory she's covered but she it, she talks about how in 1967 with the victory in the in the in the 67 war that's when she noticed that feminists started to turn against Israel and she yes. saw that right so she saw that and this was also specifically uh KGB and and East German propaganda that was being used to say oh you know now you in the West, you care about the, you know, the, the, the indigenous, the ethnic minority, the underdog. The Jews aren't that anymore. Now right. it's all change. Now they're the oh. worst oppressor out of all the oppressors. Of course. <laughs> but we do everything so great, you know. <laughs> but clearly our, our record of oppression is not that good. If you look at the, you know, what is it? Three times more Palestinian Arabs now than there were. Then life expectancy <laughs> is up. Child mortality is down. The whole thing. We're terrible at genocide. We're good at so many. Yeah, else. just don't do that right. <laughs> you know. So I did. I don't know if people noticed. I did send the text in the chat. So yeah. Well, maybe we should wrap it up there, unless anybody wants to add another word or two. David saying good night. Uh, so great to see David and Michael. They yeah. uh, have the most brilliant, amazing dance do the most brilliant amazing dance work david is one of the founders of toronto dance theater um together they have dance theater david earl uh obviously facing tough times right now but prevailing um they were doing they they were an inspiration for me doing this too because they were doing these salons but they were called cafe hugo um and it was just it was great to see everybody and and to uh to see some of the work that was shared the video work and things that were shared so it means a lot that they come Leo and cousin David and Liz. So there's people from all my little worlds. I really appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So this for will doing... be available too on on uh, as a recording at the House of Shake website when I get there. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you for thanks, doing thanks, that. Thanks, thank Robin. Thanks, okay. thanks okay. everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Much appreciated. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Leo. Bye. Night, everyone. Night. Night.